Trino is an open source SQL engine which enables federated queries across disparate data sources. As I share its origin story, you may be surprised by how many of the story's characters you'll recognize. Let's start off with the timeline. Soon after Google first launched its search service, it had to deal with the exponential growth of the World Wide Web. In 1998, Google was indexing about 25 million web pages. But within two years, the web quickly grew to over a billion pages. To be able to process so much data, Google needed to pioneer some novel techniques. At the time, it was typical to download large files into a data storage device and then later transmit the files across a network to a server where they would be processed. But transmission speeds were very slow, so it took too long to move data to compute, making the network a bottleneck in this decoupled architecture. Google designed a new file system that chopped large files into slices and equally distributed them across the servers in a cluster. The key benefit of data locality is that compute cores are co-located with disks that hold the data the cores will process, eliminating massive network transfers each time the data is processed. After Google published research papers about its file system and its MapReduce framework, these techniques were cloned to create the open source Hadoop project. MapReduce is a Java programming model for processing distributed data in parallel across the servers in a cluster. To use Hadoop, you had to write a complex Java program to transform and aggregate data through a pipeline of processing stages. MapReduce sends your program to where your data resides, rather than sending data to where your program resides. Facebook was collecting hundreds of petabytes of data about its users, so it quickly adopted Hadoop but most of its employees who wanted to analyze the data were not proficient Java programmers, so Facebook created Hive. Hive is an abstraction layer on top of MapReduce which enables its users to write SQL statements to analyze data stored in a Hadoop distributed file system. Hive automatically maps SQL operations to the low-level Java MapReduce API, thereby translating queries into MapReduce pipelines. Because the design constraints of Hadoop imposed limits on what Hive could do and on how quickly it could do it, Facebook developed Presto as a better alternative to Hive. Hadoop was designed to provide fault-tolerant batch processing, and fault tolerance was a necessity back in the early 2000s when Hadoop was run on-premises using cheap commodity servers that were expected to fail once in a while. Every stage along a MapReduce pipeline that Hive creates writes its intermediate results to disk. So if a server fails during the middle of a query's processing, Hive can recover automatically by rerunning the failed server's workload on another server in the cluster. However, all of this reading and writing to disk that makes MapReduce resilient also makes Hive queries run slowly. Presto was designed to do all of its processing in memory, enabling fast, interactive queries on the massive amount of data that Facebook had stored in Hadoop. To achieve lower latency for ad hoc queries, Presto does not care about mid-query fault tolerance. If there's a hardware failure in one of the cluster nodes, the processing will abort and the user will need to manually rerun their query. The hope was that the speed of Presto would offset the disadvantage of occasionally having to rerun a failed query. Another significant development between the time when Google needed to use data locality to the time when Facebook created Presto 
was that network transfer speeds increased by an order of magnitude from moving millions of bits per second in 2001 to moving billions of bits per second in 2012. Facebook designed the original Presto to copy data from its Hadoop cluster and push it across a high-speed network into a cluster of servers for fast in-memory processing. In fact, the first release of open source Presto required your data to be stored in a Hadoop distributed file system. Presto does not use Hive, but Facebook had all of its data stored in Hadoop, so the only source you could query with the first version of Presto was Hadoop's file system. After years of developing new connectors, Presto could query data from many disparate data sources. You may notice that some of these source types cannot be accessed natively with SQL. This is part of Presto's value proposition. You don't have to use separate languages or tools to access data across these different source types because Presto enables you to query all of them with SQL and with GUI tools that communicate via SQL. After five years of open source development, Facebook management wanted more control over the Presto project. This led to a schism and the original Presto developers left Facebook and created a separate system called Presto SQL. To avoid name confusion, Presto SQL was later renamed to Trino. Again, when network transfer speeds were slow, decoupled systems could not be used so data locality systems like Hadoop were created. But now that network speeds are much faster, systems like Trino went back to decoupled architectures because data could now be efficiently moved to compute. When comparing these diagrams, note the difference on the right side to where the data is being transferred to. In modern parallel distributed systems, data is partitioned across a cluster of servers. Therefore, systems like Trino use a combination of architectures, decoupled followed by data locality. When storage and compute are decoupled, they can be scaled independently. Since Trino is a compute layer, you can scale your query power by adjusting the number of worker nodes in its cluster. Trino's real superpower is acting like a universal translator so that you can query multiple sources from different systems with one SQL statement. When all of your sources are relational databases, Trino can perform simple SQL to SQL translations and data type mappings. Here are a few examples. For instance, an Oracle date column can contain both date and time values, so it's mapped to the Trino timestamp data type. But Trino can also do more complicated translations to enable SQL access to systems that do not use table-based data models. Here are a few examples. MongoDB is a document database, and Trino maps SQL queries to MongoDB method calls. Kafka is a stream processing platform, and each message is presented as a row in Trino. Redis is a key-value database, and each key-value pair is presented as a row in Trino. Trino employs various optimization techniques to increase processing speed decrease memory usage, and reduce the amount of data exchanged over a network. Pushdown is the most important optimization because it enables some query operations to be passed through to the underlying source systems for processing. The availability of pushdown varies by data source type. Relational databases can naturally accept SQL pushdown. Currently, Trino can push down some operations to some non-relational stores, but not to other non-relational stores. Certain parts of queries can be pushed down. A source can be forced to return only columns specified in a select clause.
Conditions in a WHERE clause can force a source to return only a required set of rows. Aggregations like COUNT, SUM, and AVERAGE can be pushed down. When multiple tables within the same source need to be joined together, that operation can be pushed down. When queries include a LIMIT clause, PUSHDOWN will enable the source to return a subset of rows. And using views can also enable you to push the processing of a query down to a source. So Trino's pushdown optimizations enable sources to reduce the amount of data they need to return to Trino over a network. On the other side of the coin is the fact that Trino was not designed to take the load off of your database because it can actually add more workload in the form of pushdown queries. This brings up an interesting point, so let's take a look at a few use cases. Let's say you have a relational database table and a NoSQL table which are updated on a monthly basis. We have users who want to mash up data from these two tables, but since the sources are heterogeneous, they ask IT to create a monthly ETL job to store the combined data in a warehouse table. Now that the join data is available in the EDW, users can query it every day using their usual SQL-based tools. If we look at the access patterns for this use case, the two source tables are read once, and the data warehouse table is read many which is cool because that's what a warehouse is for. Here's a different scenario. When users ask for a new ETL job, IT says they can't start building it until later next year, which could mean that the business will miss opportunities to benefit from insights that could be found within the mashed up data. This could be a good time to use Trino because it can assist by avoiding the need for ETL. Instead of designing and populating a new table, Trino can query the data where it lives. However, the access patterns change significantly. Instead of a read once request each month, the two source systems can now be accessed many times on a daily basis by many users. So this use case presents a trade-off. If the data mashup can truly benefit the business, then the extra workload caused by the daily Trino queries could be well worth it. Now here's a use case with a clearer decision. Say you're in the midst of a multi-year plan to migrate your data to the cloud so you'll have a hybrid environment for several years. If users want to join data from both the cloud and on-prem, but your IT department has no bandwidth to create new ETL jobs, then Trino offers them a self-serve solution. Whenever you hear about a new technology solution for the first time, you need to figure out which niche the product fills. You can use several methods to perform SQL queries via a massively parallel processing cluster. And unlike the original Hadoop implementation, which used a shared nothing architecture, Today's platforms use a shared data architecture with an elastic compute layer and an independently scalable shared storage layer. A modern Hadoop implementation runs in the cloud and its data is decoupled in object storage containers. For example, when you create an Azure HD Insight cluster, you do not store data locally. Instead, your data is stored in Azure Blob Storage, so it must be transferred over a high-speed network to the compute nodes when it needs to be processed. In addition to being cheaper to store data in Blob Storage versus storing it on compute server disks, the other big advantage of decoupling here is that the same data can be shared by many consumers, like multiple Hadoop clusters that can be spun up and down without deleting the data, plus other non-Hadoop apps too. As I mentioned earlier, Hadoop uses a disk-based fault tolerance method, so Hive is good for processing a large amount of data when speed is not a priority. Spark is a data processing engine, 
with sets of libraries for tasks like SQL, machine learning, and streaming. It handles loading data from storage systems and performing computation on it, but Spark is not a data storage solution. It was created as a faster alternative to Hadoop, and it accomplishes this by processing data in memory. Spark achieves fault tolerance by keeping track of a pipeline's lineage of transformations, rather than by persisting intermediate results to disk. Data engineers often use Spark for ETL jobs because it can perform parallel data processing on vast amounts of data without crashing or losing data when hardware failures occur. Trino is a SQL query engine. It is not a database because it does not include its own data storage system. When I contacted someone on Facebook's data engineering team, he said they use Spark for heavy ETL jobs, and they use their own version of Trino, which is still called Presto, for lighter jobs and for ad hoc queries. He said that Presto and Trino are easier to use than Spark, and they are usually faster, but Presto and Trino can suffer out of memory crashes when a huge amount of data is queried. Now the caveat here is that Facebook employees often query petabytes of data. So if you're not working with web scale data, and if your Trino cluster is sufficiently large, you should hopefully not suffer so many out of memory errors. Snowflake offers the functionality of a traditional relational database, but as a cloud native platform. When Snowflake cannot fit all the data for an operation into memory, it starts spilling data, first to the local disk of a cluster node, and then to remote cloud storage. These operations ensure fault tolerance, but they are slower than processing completely in memory. Users can leverage Trino by using their existing SQL skills and their usual database tools and BI tools. The Trino command line interface provides a terminal-based interactive shell for running queries. Client libraries can be used to run queries from several programming languages like Python, R, Go, Node.js, and Ruby. A SQL management tool can be used to interact with databases via a JDBC driver, and another driver enables any application supporting ODBC to use Trino, such as BI and reporting tools. After a user sends a SQL query to the coordinator, the coordinator acts very much like a traditional database management system, except that it spreads the workload over a cluster. The parser converts the user's SQL statement into a format which represents its structure, and then the analyzer verifies syntax rules and references made to tables and columns. The planner generates a query plan which represents the steps that need to be performed to answer the query, and the cost-based optimizer uses table and column statistics to determine the optimal plan. The scheduler breaks up the plan into stages and distributes each stage as a series of tasks across worker nodes to enable parallel processing. The scheduler also sends the location of the split of source data that each worker should retrieve and process. Workers use a connector to fetch metadata and a data split and then to convert the source data into Trino's in-memory format. Workers collaborate to process the data until one worker can provide results back to the coordinator so it can answer the user's query. I hope you enjoyed learning about Trino's history, architecture, and usage.